idea. Uh, but give him x-rays. And um, so one of the things I did years ago, they made toothpaste, and they had a pump. Do you remember the pump toothpaste? I don't even think they have it anymore, but they had a pump toothpaste. And literally close to there was a hair gel that literally was in the same pump. And, and the reason I know that is because I accidentally picked up the wrong thing one day. Now, I did not try it, thankfully, but what I did is I thought, this is a great illustration because I was trying to talk to the students about it's what's inside our hearts that comes out sometimes, right? And so what I did is I switched the labels and I brought Tony up. And Tony was one of my awesome youth in West Palm Beach. He's probably like 50 years old now. That's, yeah, that's bad. But anyway, so Tony comes up. He was so hyper. He made me seem mellow. And Tony came up and I, I presented him with the toothpaste that was actually gel. And I asked him, what's inside of here? To which he said, toothpaste, because he read the label on the outside. And I said, nay, nay, you are incorrect. It is hair gel. And then all the students thought they would help out because Tony said, no way, that's hair gel. Look at that. It's perfectly packaged, and, and it's in the thing, and blah, blah, blah. And the kids started yelling, taste it, taste it, taste it. Now, Tony was more hyper than me and apparently about as smart. Because Tony took a big old glob of hair gel on his finger and put it in his mouth and about lost his mind. It was awesome and thankfully not toxic. What happened? What came out? Now, here's the other thing. If I said to Tony or if I said to you, put the toothpaste back in the toothpaste tube, you can't do it. And the truth is about our words, we can't take them back. If you were here for the last work day or a couple, I guess it's two work days ago, I had told people, hey, listen, I know how to set a toilet. That's not a problem. No big deal. And Rodney very well remembers this. And so I went to set the toilet in the bathroom. It was, it was wobbly in the men's room. And I thought, I can do that. That's pretty easy. Uh, and uh, so I went in there and I, I had the stuff I needed. And when I went to turn the valve, I broke the valve off the wall off the wall, totally off the wall, flooded the bathroom. Rodney, as I went to get supplies, actually vacuumed uh, up the water the whole time I was gone to keep the church from flooding. Very nice of you, by the way. And I, so I finally got to the store, got back, and literally handed the stuff to Joe and said, please fix it because I'm an idiot, right? Now, I don't know if you've had those embarrassing moments, but I have many of them. I actually had a hard time deciding which embarrassing thing I've done and said that I would need to fix. How many of you have ever said something to somebody you wish you could take back? Yes, I'm not going to ask who did it this morning on the way here because we're not going to start a family affair, a feud right here. Beep, 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 beep. So here's what I want you to know. The most powerful things on earth are not nuclear missiles. They, they are not the weapons of our warfare. They are our words. And... When you look at the beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis, so God spoke things into being, and here's the truth about your words, is that you can speak things into being, encouraging somebody or hurting somebody. And listen, listen, I want it, I want it to be bigger than even what you say to others. The words you say to yourself, too. And so I want you to be really careful. Some of you are wonderful at saying wonderful things to other people. But you are awful in the mirror. And so, and you're awful in your head, right? And so today as we talk about this, I want to encourage you to, to evaluate whether your words match your actions, knowing that God can use words to change the lives of others and of us. And then just to acknowledge God's power in all those things. So let's pick up with the first point. Number one, recognize the power of your words. And if you don't get anything else today, and maybe you forget the rest of it, listen recognize the power of your words. And not just what you say, because we don't talk as much as we used to. What do we do now? Text, email. And the truth is, some of you uh, speak more words with your fingers today than you do with your mouth. I mean, that's just the, the nature of the world. I, I know I speak much more with my mouth just because I talk fast. And some people today are out. Amen out there. All right, James 3, 3 through 6. Oh, by the way, right before James 3, 3 through 6, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, James says... We all stumble in many ways. And I always feel like James is like, okay, I'm getting ready to tell you some places that you really mess up. So before I tell you all the places that you and I mess up, I want you to know everybody struggles with this so that you don't read it and go, oh, 
man. And here's what he says. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Though they're large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. And what it's saying is, this is what can determine the direction of your life. And I would say more than just the words that come out of your mouth, also the words that go through your mind are the same way. So continue. The tongue is a fire. And I love that. That's very country. A fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. And so what, the, what does this mean? It's a world of evil. He's speaking to believers, but here's what he's saying. The enemy... Satan, we're going to talk about demons in a minute, can use your words, even if you're a believer. That's Watson, our brand new baby. You can cry as much as you want, Watson. He's only heard me like this before this. Watson, does this sound familiar? He's been to church a lot, just he was pre-born. So. But here's the truth about our words. We have to be very careful why. And I don't want to ha have you raise hands because I just know it's true. We all remember something in our childhood that somebody said to us. And even me saying that changes your faces because you all go, yeah. We all have one thing. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was an enemy. Somebody said something to us and we, oh, we still feel that. So the enemy can use those words and we have to make sure that we understand that the words that were spoken to us that aren't true, that we do what the Bible says and we take every thought captive and recognize that wasn't true. And for some of us, we have to say, well, my parents were just doing the best they could, but what they said to me was not true. And I'm no longer going to live under that lie that the enemy planted in my heart years ago that I'm a loser, that I'm not needed, that I'm in the way, that I'm an irritation, that I'm frustrating. By the way, I had a pastor one time tell me that God told him to tell me that I was a pest. Anybody in here think that's from God? Right? Now, granted, can I be honest with you? There are times that I'm a pest. You get around me with enough coffee in me and I'll drive you crazy. And some people enjoy it. Other people say, I don't know how your wife puts up with you, right? But the truth is, there are people who can speak into your life that don't always say things that are from God. So be very, very careful what you believe and even what you say to yourself. Be very careful what you believe because it corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. It means that a word said to you. We all know people who've been told so many negative things that they live their life now with their head down. They're afraid to do. They're afraid to branch out. They're afraid to step out. They don't want to get hit again. They're like a dog that's been beaten and everything they do, they're looking out. Why? Because it wasn't just up here. It wasn't just in here. When somebody said something, it went to their heart and caught them on fire. And sometimes we have to ask God, would you put that fire out? Now, I don't know if you ever talk to yourself negatively. I, I had a negative moment this week. I've had a few. When you're in the hospital and you don't feel good, by the way, we're spiritual, physical, and emotional. When you physically don't feel well, it's very hard to feel up in the other areas of your life, just so you know. So we struggle more when we struggle. And I think God allows that sometimes so we can deal with the fact that he's with us even in those times. So this week, my mom had mentioned, hey, the, the dishwasher is making noise. My mom lives with us, if you didn't know that. And dishwasher's making noise. And I said, oh, it's just the dishes banging around. And then early one morning, I turned on the dishwasher, and I heard it, and I went, 
that's not just the dishes banging around. So I opened up the dishwasher. I pulled out the tray. I got my phone because, you know, we don't carry flashlights anywhere anymore except our phone. So I got my phone out, and I looked, and there was a piece of plastic that somebody had put on the heat element on the bottom, and it was stuck there, and it was hitting the little thing as it would go around. Bloop, 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 bloop. I pulled that out. I shut that dishwasher. I pushed play again. Oh, it was quiet. I was so proud of myself. And then I looked around and I thought, where's my phone? And I thought, well, I had gone to the restroom a few minutes ago, so I went over there. No, nope, no phone there. Well, I was watching TV earlier and sitting on the couch. Let me, no, nope, my phone's not there. Oh, I was out on the porch for a little while. Let me go out on the porch. No, my phone's not there. I wonder where my phone is. Five minutes. Five minutes. And I finally went, no. You, you wouldn't have, sure enough, I went to the dishwasher, I opened the dishwasher, there is my iPhone sitting on top of a pot in the dishwasher, flashlight on! <laughs> now, can I tell you the conversation I had with myself was not very nice, right? My dad, when I was a kid, when something like that would happen, would say, well, you pulled an Eric. You know what that taught me? That I'm an idiot. And so guess what conversation I had with myself when I did the... Now, be honest. That's an idiot thing to do. But it doesn't make me an idiot. Do you hear me? Be careful when you do something dumb, you don't label yourself as dumb. Did you hear the difference? Be careful when you're correcting your children. Randy, this is for you. You got a new, new baby back there. And so, so be careful even when you're correcting your children that you don't say that what they do is who they are. See, some of us had the other way, too. When we did a good job at home, our parents would say, well, you're the good kid. My parents one time told me I was the good kid because I worked the hardest. My dad told me that one day on the way home from work. And so then suddenly I was in competition with my brothers and sisters. I didn't even know it, didn't even realize it. Do you hear how wrong that is to think that way? Now, I understand what he was doing. He was trying to compliment me. But, but who you are is not what you do. Can I, can I tell you something else? I'm just going to be honest with you. It's been really hard being in the hospital a lot. Because I like to go. I know that's hard for you to believe that I like to do stuff. I don't like to sit still. I've watched more TV in the last four months than I've ever watched. It's horrible. I get, I'm tired of TV. I'll put on a baseball game and just watch it. Uh, uh, baseball. By the way, you can sleep through baseball all, every day. And here's the truth. What my, what my inner voice starts to say to me, and what the enemy starts to say to me, is you're useless. You can't even do what you used to do. You're, you're never going to be able to pastor like you used to pastor. And the enemy will lie to you. Have you heard these conversations in your head? Hey, if I can put an iPhone with a flashlight on and have a negative conversation with myself, can I tell you that when I really do something dumb, I can have a lot better conversations that are negative? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Look for ways... To use words to bless. And the reason I say that is this. The people around you are struggling with those voices too. So let them know they're not who somebody said they are. After church last night, a young lady came up to me and said, Would you pray for me? I'm struggling in this area. And most of what I prayed for her is, Lord, help her to know how special she is. Help her to know how loved she is. Help her to know how important she is. Why? <laughs> Were you ever in junior high? Some of you haven't left junior high behind yet. You're still struggling with who you are. Hey, it's okay to just be you. I mean, I, people tell me all the time, Pastor, you make me feel really good about myself. Thanks. But I know what they mean. You know, one of the awesome things that's happened in the last few weeks, I got two different phone calls from people that I didn't even talk to. One started a ministry that we talked about this morning that's going to be visiting people who are hurting. The second one is I had a, one of our young ladies call me and say, I want to do something for new moms, but not only for new moms, but where older moms can come in and speak into the lives of new moms. Can I do that? Well, yeah, that'd be great. I had nothing to do with it. And it was almost like God was saying to me, hey, Eric, guess what? When you can't, I can't. Quit trying to do it all. Look for ways to use your way to best. By the way, if you have family members, text them. You text them, hey, I'm praying for you today. Hey, I just want you to know you're awesome. Hey, I love how you fill in the blank. 
By the way, when your kids home, come home from school, rather than asking them how their day went, I heard this this week, I think it's great, ask them who they helped. Ask them who they encouraged. That's more important than whether their teacher in third period gave them a whatever on the, right? Because we want them to be good humans. I love this. Don't mix bad words with your bad mood. You'll have many opportunities to change a mood, but you'll never get the opportunity to replace the words you spoke. Number two, repent when your words don't match deeds. Now, I'm going to show you a disturbing picture, but it's absolutely true. Here it is. Be careful what you say, especially to children. But I could put many adults in this picture because they still have that hand wrapped around their neck from when they were little and these words were spoken to them. I know you may not be able to read it, but it says, you're such an embarrassment. You're a moron. You're a fool. You're a brat. You're a punk. You're a pig. You're a pain. You're a pest, right? And some of us as adults, that hand is still wrapped around our neck because of something we heard. Listen, the way to get rid of that is say, God, I want to receive who you've made me to be. I know that you see me as special. You see me as important. You've given me a purpose. I can be a blessing to other people even when I feel like I can't. Verse 13 picks up. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it. How? By their good life. By deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. What does that mean? It's not just words. It's also the things you do. Make sure they line up. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition. These are two things I'm going to pick up on in a minute. Okay? Bitter envy, selfish ambition. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom doesn't come down from heaven but is earthly. This is that selfish gravity. Unspiritual. Demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, we're back there, right? There you'll find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven. Now listen to this. You can almost hear the peace as we start to say these words. Is first of all pure. Then peace loving. Considerate. Submissive. Full of mercy. Good fruit. Impartial and sincere. Which means you're not two-faced. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now this idea of, of bitter envy and selfish ambition, these are the two things. It's when we say, I wish I was more like them. That's bitter envy. I wish I had what they have. I wish I was more like that. But then selfish ambition is, how can I use that person to help me? How can I use that person to help me? And we all struggle with both of these things. If we don't lie about it is what the scripture's saying here. Just be honest and say, oh, I really did that so they would notice. I really thought I was doing that for Jesus, but I really did it so they would notice that I did it. And just be honest about it. God, you know my heart. Years ago, I heard a story about a pastor. Somebody from his church came to him and said, uh, Pastor, I want to repent i've been gossiping about you and spreading stuff and people have left our church because of the stuff i've said to them about you and i just want to apologize to you for gossiping about you all these years the pastor said well i forgive you but i want you to do two things for me and the person said whatever you want me to do which you should never say to a pastor by the way he said i want you to take this feather pillow and i want you to go downtown and i want you to take the feather pillow and i want you to just rip it open let the feathers fly. And so, okay, pastor, I'll do that. So the person goes downtown. They go to the middle of town. Poof, feathers everywhere. Wind's blowing. Just poof. Comes back to the pastor with the empty outside and says, okay, pastor, what's the second thing? He said, go pick up all the feathers. What? Well, I just want you to know, even though you've apologized because of what you've done and said about me over the years... Other people believe what you... And there's no way to go back and collect all the feathers. Listen, once you spread negative things, once you say things to hurt other people, even behind their backs when you slander them, we're going to talk about that in a minute, you can't just put it back in the bottle. You can apologize. You can try to make things right. But the truth is, once those feathers fly... Haven't you ever had somebody come to you that somebody else told them something that somebody else said about whatever? By the way, on Twitter this week, they're, they're gossiping about the royals. And I, I read one of them. I'm like, I don't even know who these people are. How am I? What? I, So-and-so's crying. This person's not crying. They must be arrogant there. I'm like, how slanderous is that? Listen to what the Bible says about that. 
Brothers and sisters, don't slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. Now, there's two kinds of judgment in the Bible, and I, I don't have time to go into all the details about it. But this is the judgment that you can never overcome. There's actually a verse in the Bible where Paul says that we need to judge other believers. And he's talking about people who are doing destructive things and hurting themselves and others. And there's a time that you have to go and say, that's not good. But that's not the kind of judgment it's talking about here. This is talking about guilty before you even know what's going on. Speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? You ever had that bitter envy? You ever slander somebody? You ever say something about somebody? And truth is, you didn't even know. You, you might have passed on third-hand information. Just repent. That's the next little encouragement to you. Repent. And of any boasting, any hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you say, I can't believe they did that, knowing that you do similar things. And so we just need to repent. What does repent mean? God, I choose to turn around. I choose to make that right. Number three regularly submit to God with words. I want to tell you how important words are. When I was in college, I had a 740 in the morning class. Now, 740 is not early to me anymore. The older I get, the later 740 is. This morning, 445. Boom! Wide awake. Just wide awake. That's old man coming out. Right? I, I'm probably going to sleep one hour a day by the time I get to 80. Right? And then sleep 12 hours in my chair watching TV. Right? Okay. So, don't touch that. I was watching that. Okay. So, here's the deal. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's sad. That's sad. You all laughed. Okay, so, so I'm in college, 740 class. So I literally jump up, grab, ready, ready, boat shorts, teal color with big boat sailboats on it. This is the 80s, kids. The old days. Big boat shorts. I had a striped shirt, red stripes, put that shirt on. Had one red sock, one blue sock, t tennis shoes, ran to class. Got to class, sat down. The guy next to me goes, dude, what are you wearing? I go, you didn't hear? Today is no match Thursday. Nobody told you? It's like, no. Now, here's what's funny about that. If you look in my college yearbook, there is a picture of about five guys. I'm not with them. One of them is a missionary. Been a missionary for years now. I'm not even with them. They are wearing ties, jackets, crazy shorts, and two different socks. No Match Thursday became a thing at our college because I randomly said No Match Thursday. Listen, I, I, something so silly I just want to say to show you the power of words. I've run into people from college who said to me, dude, I remember No Match Thursday, dude. I'm like, I don't. What? But you never know where your words are going to go. Listen to this. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this town and spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Or like some very famous guy said, all we are is dust in the wind, dude. You're a mist that appears and vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, listen, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then, I love this verse, knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it to them, it's sin. Basically, if God shows you something, some way you need to help somebody, then help them. You need to do what it takes to help them to do what you're supposed to do. We have to recognize that we can't even say the right things without God's power. We don't get it right. Because somebody said negative things to us. And if we go without God's power, we'll just pass that on generation to generation to generation. But if you recognize those words that aren't from God and say, God, I submit to your power in all areas of my life and let him begin to change you, then your words will change. And guess what? You'll break that curse and the generations after you will see the blessing. Take time to acknowledge God's power. That's my last big encouragement to you today. Take time to acknowledge God's power. 
I heard a story that was really good. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Blind Side about Michael Orr? If you haven't seen it, I encourage you, watch that movie. It's about a Christian family. Uh, they don't make a real big deal about the Christian. Anytime, by the way, anytime you see a secular movie that has people pray, then they probably prayed a lot more than they show in that movie, okay? And so, uh, just like Mr. Rogers, they have a prayer scene in Mr. Rogers. You know he was a good Christian when you see that movie because they even put it in a secular movie. It was so important in his life. Here's the deal. So, at a conference recently, Michael Orr, who was adopted, if you don't know the story, and then later became a professional football player, his brother said it was two words that changed their life. As their family drove past Michael Orr in the cold rain, and they saw him, the mom saw him and said these two words to her husband, turn around. And he said, those two words changed our family and changed Michael's life. Listen, I don't know which way you're headed with your words. I don't know which way you're headed with the words you say to others, which way you're headed with the words you say to yourself, but there's time to turn around. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how healthy you are. I don't care how unhealthy you are. I mean, I care. But some of us need to turn around in some of the ways we think. Some of us who are wonderful at saying wonderful things to others are not good about what we say to ourselves. Turn around. Some of us are fine with ourselves and we're terrible about what we say to others. Turn around. Let God use you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or if you're watching online, you can do that today. If you want to surrender your life to him knowing that he died for your sins and rose again today, you can turn around. That's called repentance. Repent from your sins and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. The Bible says when that happens, that he trades our sinfulness for his righteousness. It's not fair. But he loves us not fairly. So if you want to do that today, I'd be glad to talk to you after the service. If you're watching online, you can send us a text or a note. You can send me an email. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. I pray that you'd bless each one that's here. I pray that you would, Father, those who say wonderful words to others, but don't say wonderful words to themselves, Lord, would you convict them of the sin of not recognizing who they are in you. Father, I pray also for those of us who struggle sometimes with the words we say to others, would you make us very aware and help us to turn around and become encouragers and blessers and not allow the enemy to use us to discourage and gossip and hurt other people. Help us instead to build up and help others to grow. That can only be done because of your power in us. In Jesus' name, amen.